Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Hillsboro Seventh Day Adventist Church. It's just, it's wonderful to see so many people here and uh, the opportunity to get together. Um, and it's wonderful to have those of you who are, uh, who are watching on uh, the internet today. That's a real blessing. I, if you couldn't be here, I'm glad you're there. So it's, it's just uh, a wonderful opportunity. So this morning, um, we're, we're going to be, uh, Pastor Danny's gonna lead us uh, in a study of Daniel 4. He's leading us through the book of Daniel. And Daniel 4 is pretty interesting in that um, it appears to be sort of the testimony of, of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. So it's written in first person. I, you know, I Nebuchadnezzar doesn't so. So anyway, Donna and I kind of um, focused on that um, to pick hymns of praise that sort of could have been kind of the message uh, that Nebuchadnezzar um, was feeling at the time. We, we did our best to try to, to focus on that. The first one, um, oh, uh, I'm joined today, we're joined today by Nine Air Greaves and by Aaron uh, Thor Thorpe. I, I'm always torn between Thorpe and Thorn because I had a roommate by the name of Thorn who you kind of physically remind me of just a little bit. Um, Anyway, so we are singing uh, songs of praise. Um, the first one is number 82 in the hymnal, and, and I noticed we have hymnals in the pews now. That's wonderful. Um, but for Jehovah's awful throne, and, and I know a lot of people get hung up on the word awful. Um, remember that Isaac Watts wrote this in 1719 or something like that. Um, when words meant a little bit different. In fact, if you look it up in the dictionary, the third or fourth um, definition is um, inspiring awe or, or commanding awe, filled with profound reverence in this case. Um, and there's generally a note that says something like this one, now uh, rare or archaic. Yeah, so, um, if it makes you more comfortable, the word awesome is pretty similar. You can sing awesome, it fits perfectly. So let's sing Before Jehovah's Awful Throne.
I didn't realize when we chose the music that we would have hymnals. And for one of the first times since Donna and I have been doing this, I picked something that's not in the hymnal. Um, this is Jack Hayford's little uh, uh, song, Majesty, um, which I presume many of you are familiar with. Um, kind of the novel thing about it, uh, from, from my perspective, is that he makes liberal use of triplets, um, which is just a musical figure that, to me, sounds like the Herald Trumpets. So you can think of, as we're talking about majesty, um, da, 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 da. you can think of the Herald Trumpets blasting out a fanfare there. So let's sing Majesty. We'll go through it twice. wants to talk a little bit about a project he's working on that I, I just, uh, I don't know very much about it yet, but it sounds fascinating. So here you go. <clears throat> Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. <laughs> Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Awesome. Uh, so for looking out, I recognize a lot of you, but I'm sure I'll more of you don't recognize me. My name is Aaron Thorpe. I am Jolie Gady's husband, now Jolie Thorpe. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my wife would collaborate if she were here that I do all the chores in the house very willingly and without complaint. And she is luckily not here today, but she can collaborate that later. So, um, when I was very young, as far back as I can remember, my grandparents played music. We come from a very Hispanic family, 
And whenever we would go, like three times a year, there'd be huge family gatherings and there would be people playing accordion, guitar, piano, organ, everything, every single family gathering. And it was a huge part of me growing up. And so when we transitioned from that, and I was five years old, I started taking lessons in guitar, always was singing. In middle school, my teachers pressed upon me to start teaching myself, um, meaning teaching other students, and so I started doing that. Um, I sang with the Adventist Men's Chorus for a long time. I ended up going to Walla Walla University to get a performance degree. And all that to say is that throughout that entirety of my childhood and into my adulthood, I had many people who had to be very patient with me <laughs> and teach me a lot of things that were very difficult to learn. And they always made it fun, they always made it enjoyable, and they always promoted a good atmosphere while doing it. Which, now doing that, I currently work at Oregon Music Academy as my job, and it is, it is not easy to do. All that to say is that once a week, I would love to have as many people who would want to join me to have a praise team slash music group, and we're just gonna play music. It doesn't matter if you can read notes or not. It doesn't matter if you play strictly by ear or a mixture of the two. All that being said, I would love it if any of you have impressed upon you to play music with a group where there's no judgment and you can come and just play, please contact me. I'm not that scary, I promise. Um, if you were here last week, you probably saw the guest appearance of my daughter and son up here. Of course, my son came and grabbed the mic. He knows what that's for. And so, all that being said, um, thank you for listening to this announcement. And if you want to play with this group, uh, we're trying to meet once a week. Right now it's Wednesdays, but that's flexible. Uh, please just come talk to me. And my number, any of the pastors, uh, I have given them permission to give my number out. So, thank you. Thanks, Aaron. I've, I've maintained for a long time, and I think I've said it here before. Music is too much fun to be a spectator sport. It is so much more fun to actually be involved, and it, it's not rocket science um, unless you get into music theory, and we don't have to go there. Uh, Anyway, our opening song uh, today is My Maker and My King. It's uh, number 15 in the book if you want to follow along there. Would you stand please as we sing this? Sovereign bounty is the 
Thank you so much. You may be seated. I'll have to bring it down a bit. Okay, good morning, everyone. So as most of you know, uh, I am the new Bible worker in our church. And for me, this is a, a learning curve. So um, I wanted to kind of share with you some information that I have and some things where I've kind of started uh, doing. And first of all, um, I worked on the website. As you can see here, uh, my husband is showing you the website. And um, if you haven't been there before, I encourage you to go check it out. It changes frequently and, um, you know, we, we have a lot more, um, we're not perfect, but we're learning and we're getting there. Um, and so on the website at the top, um, you'll see some um, uh, words going across there. And if you go to information and you click on that, um, you'll see Bible study. And that's a, something that I have been working on. Um, I want people, if they want to study the Bible, um, to, you know, learn more about God, um, that they can go there and find out a ways to do it. Now, the first thing, we have a group Bible study that we meet Tuesday nights here in the fellowship hall um, between 6.30 and 7.30. We are going through a book, and anybody that comes will be given a book um, although I think at this point we've, I don't know if we have any books left, but no books left, Deanna says. But, um, you know, anybody that wants to come can come and we can get you one. And uh, we will be continuing through this book. And it's um, called um, Daring to Ask for More. And it's about prayer. And so that's a wonderful Bible study. Now, if you scroll down, you see there's online Bible study. And below that is the request private Bible study. So if you want to meet with somebody in person, you can go to this link anywhere in there and you can click on it and it takes you to a page where you can uh, input your information and that information comes to me. So I would be able to get it and contact you and be able to set you up with a Bible coach that can uh, do personal online Bible studies. So anyone that goes to our website can find this. So if you go back, and you see um, the middle one that's green, online Bible study. This is the exciting one for me. So if you click on that, it will take you to a new page. And that page is our Discover Bible School. Anybody can go there and they can scroll down, they can click on the Discover Bible Guides and start a um, study on that. They can do focus um, prophecy, or you can have children do a Bible study, which is wonderful. That's all online, done at your own uh, pace. However, the interesting thing is, is under each question that you answer, there's a place for you to ask a question. And at the end, there's a place for you to ask a question. So you can always ask your question, and that again comes to whoever is assigned as your Bible coach. And you would be communicating online. So the exciting thing is now we have one person doing um, Discover Bible um, Guides online right now. And so I'm really excited about that. Now, the other thing we have done is we have contracted with somebody to make um, ads on Facebook, on Instagram, and um, on Google, I believe. And these ads come out on Facebook. Here's one of them. And it is just a generic ad. It's from my free Bible study. This goes out to anybody in the zip code of 97124. If you go through the zip code of 97124, there's a chance that you will find this ad. There's also another one that's uh, Prophecy Countdown, that if anybody's interested in prophecy and they would like to study that, they can also sign up for my free Bible study. Now, here's the exciting story I have to tell. We get five leads a month from, this, um, from these leads, from these um, ads that are going out on Facebook and Instagram. Out of those five leads, five people have requested Bible studies. One of them responded. And we went to her house. 
And when we got there, it was just her. And then she had a caregiver show up and the caregiver was cooking. She had some health issues. So the caregiver was cooking for her and we were discussing with her. And she goes, well, how is it gonna work? We're using the It Is Written Discover Bible, story, uh, Bible Guides. And we asked her if there was anything, you know, we tried to get to know her. We asked her if there was anything that she wanted to learn. And she says, no, I just want to study the Bible. Wonderful. Started with lesson one. We explained to her that this is what we want you to do. We want you to go through this this next week. We want you to fill it out, make, you know, write in all the places. And on a separate piece of paper, we want you to write any questions you have. Next week when we come back, we're going to go over it with you. And we'll answer your questions. And her comment was, really? You're going to answer my questions? She got really excited. She goes, I haven't had anybody do that before. So we were really excited. We gave it to her and we left. The next week, went back. Well, she was there, but so was her husband. And her husband participated, and he was acted really excited, like he really wanted to learn. So we were like thrilled. You know, praise the Lord. Now we have the woman who requested it, but also her husband. The next week, her husband's sister was there. So now we have her, her husband, and her husband's sisters all participating, all asking questions. Praise the Lord. Amen. That was just for the month of April. Okay, so we're going to get five more for the month of May and five more for the month of June, five, five every month. And so if only one contacts us, praise the Lord, right? So right now we have this Bible study going in person at this lady's house. We have another in-person Bible study going as well and one online Bible study going. So I'm going to need some help. I can't just do this by myself. <laughs> so, <clears throat> excuse me, I just can't do this by myself. I have a few people who have been willingly um, helping me do this. Anybody can do this. We give you this help to do it. So you will have these guides to go through. You don't have to do it alone. Besides, the Holy Spirit is with you and can guide you. So if anybody is interested in helping do Bible studies, I would love it to, if you contact me, um, and again, you will have all the support you need. So praise the Lord for what we have, and let's keep praying that the Holy Spirit will um, fall on those people who are interested, whose hearts are open to learn about him. Thank you. All right, happy Sabbath, everyone. So today we're, children's story, we're gonna be talking about insects. I think with the weather getting warmer and the flowers starting to bloom, you'll probably see more insects, insects so um, we're gonna learn about them today. So you guys will probably know what this is. Okay, so this is our first insect we're gonna be talking about. They, you know, when the flowers bloom, they, they like to, take the nectar, and then they go back to the honeycombs and make honey. Do you guys know what this is? You guys know what it is? Yes, yes, it is a bee. So bees are kind of um, known to be busy bees, and we're gonna get talk a little bit about why they're called busy bees. Bees have um, been around for a really long time. 3,000 years ago, the Bible even mentions about bees. He talks about them in Israel. He refers Israel as the land flowing of milk and honey because bees make the honey. So a um, lot of things that bees do, they're very productive. But one thing, if you notice about the bee's body is the bees have a very big body, especially the bumblebees, and their wings are very tiny and they're very thin. So they have to fly really hard. They they not only like make honey, right? They do a lot of great things. They also pollinate, make more flowers. But they also really work hard flying. It's very difficult to fly when you have a very big body and a very, very small wings. Do you know how many strokes it takes of their wings to fly in a second? One second. How many strokes do you think the wings have to fly? 
10. That's a lot. Anyone else? What's it? 100 million? <laughs> it takes 200 strokes usually, approximately, to, per second for a bee to fly. So they work really hard just even flying. There's another insect that we have here that doesn't really take very much. It's the opposite of the bee. It's got a very small body, but it has very large wings. And the butterfly is very interesting too. It's a miracle itself because butterflies don't just magically become butterflies, right? They're first caterpillars. I don't have a picture of that, but they make a cocoon. And once they're in the cocoon, they turn into a beautiful butterfly. Now the butterfly's wings are very big. How many strokes do you think a butterfly does? Per second. You got it, yes. Probably around 10, 10 strokes per second, right? And they're usually, sometimes it doesn't look like they're um, flying. It looks kind of like they're just like floating like in the air. Right, so there's some butterflies here. There you go, floating in the air. Okay. You know, it says in the Bible, in Colossians 3.23, it says, work at everything you do with all your heart. Work as if you're working for the Lord. Whether you do easy tasks, like flying for the butterfly, or hard tasks, like flying like a bee, we need to do everything that we can. We don't want to quit. Bees never quit, no matter what they do. They always work really hard. And that's what Jesus wants us to do as well. He wants us to always do our best, work our best, be like busy bees, right? Work your best, do your best for the Lord, and he will bless you, okay? All right, let's, can we just do a small prayer, and then we'll close our children's story? Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, please help us do everything we do the best, whether it is hard or easy in our life, Lord, we pray that you will give us the strength and courage and help us, Lord, and remind us um, to be like busy bees and never to quit and to do the best that we can. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay. Thank you. You know who works harder than anybody? Moms. Moms are, um, they mean the world to us and to me. If, and if, if you had a mom or have a mom, you do have a mom, right? Everyone has a mom. Uh, and, and then... We want to appreciate the moms in our lives. And if you are a mom, thank you. So what we did is, I need some help. We got some little gifts for mom. And actually, we got some flowers. Um, if you have a mom, okay, if your mom is here, I want you to come up and help me, okay? Or if you're sitting next to a mom, I need you to help me. And we got some flowers, some roses, and, some, and, some, and, a, and a gift for your mom. So come up here. And I got some adult people to help me too. But if you're a kid, come on, on, come on up, and come, come and get, come get a flower. Let's get let kids get first. Get a, get a, yeah, get for your mom, a grandma too, or well, maybe a grandma, okay. And get a flower, and get a flower, okay. All right. Yes, get a flower. Okay. And I know that if maybe you are a mom or you had a mom, and we want to make sure that you are also appreciated. And if the deacons, after the mothers get their flowers. Okay. If you could help them pass the rest out. Yeah. So take one. What do we take with that one? Take this one, yeah. Take that one. You take that. Do you need one? Okay. Yeah. Actually, take that. Thank you. We want. We just want to make sure we don't leave people out. If you're, a, if you have a mom, if you're a mom, uh, we want to get a flower to you. Uh, we appreciate the ladies out there uh, for making this uh, a wonderful event, and I hope all of you have a wonderful Mother's Day. Um, as you know, um, we, we lost an office manager, but the, we've been praying for help in our church, and um, God has sent us some help. Um, 
you know we have a youth pastor. Victor has done an awesome job uh, with the youth up there every Friday night. And uh, so we appreciate him and his ministry. And he has a team going. And, and we have Teresa. He's our Bible worker. Um, she's doing some great work in, in Bible work. I'm not sure if you noticed this week, there was a little bulletin thing. We we're making little announcement slides we're making. Um, our MailChimp, our announcement page is, we missed a couple of weeks, but it's getting going. And, uh, and the reason all that stuff's going again is because God has sent us a secretary. And I want to introduce you to her today because so you can see her face. Wendy? This is Wendy Gettings, okay? Um, say hi, Wendy. Hi. Uh, and she will be our, our secretary. She is, she is, in my opinion, awesome job she's doing. Uh, she's doing our announcements. She's helping with the website. She's helping with MailChimp. Um, she's getting our calendars organized. Everything that I don't really want to do. Um, but the, this church won't be able to function without her help. So thank you for your help. And her husband's back there. Wave hi, Rick. There you go. Uh, husband and Boston's here too. So thank you. So when you get an email from our secretary, you know who she is now, uh, Wendy Gettings. No? Okay. Happy Sabbath, everybody, and want to say uh, Happy Mother's Day. Uh, my mom passed back in 2011. Of course, I'm an old man now, so <laughs> uh, I think about her a lot, and Dad also. But anyway, um, want to remind you: we see we have the tithe envelopes in our pews again, and along with the uh, can't think hymnals, but. Um, some of you, I think, have kind of missed the white box there. And we want to encourage you to uh, remind you, uh, especially when we have visitors, that white box next to the office door is where we put the tithe because we're not able to pick up tithe anymore. And I think we're going to have a sign soon, correct? Especially that would be helpful for the visitors. So just a reminder. And um, uh, Noah... Is Noah and his family here? Uh, what I understand is that um, Grandpa, I guess, or Grandfather, and maybe some other members are experiencing some illnesses. So we want to remember Noah's family in our prayers this morning. So if, for those of you who are able, I'd like to invite you to kneel, if you can. And um, we will have our prayer this morning. Gracious Father, once again, we want to thank you so much for this wonderful day that you've given us. And you've invited us to come apart from the world and um, fellowship with you. You call us a peculiar people, a special people in your eye. And so we are pilgrims in this world, and we so look forward to coming home. Father, we want to praise you for all the moms. Um, they brought us into this world. They cared for us. Sometimes they spanked us, and they kept us in line. But we thank them for all they have done. We don't thank them enough. And um, even though dads go to work and uh, do a lot of stuff, bring, maybe bring home the the meat, as it were. Moms do a lot behind the scenes. So, again, we praise you for those. Father, we want to thank Noah and his family and um, lift them up to you. Uh, there's some you know, illness or sickness. So you know what it is. We just ask that you place thy healing hand upon them, encourage them, and strengthen them. Father, I know there are many others here with uh, special requests and also praises. And so we want to pause for just a moment that we may acknowledge them. 
And Father, again, we come to you with praise. And thank you for all that you have done. You gave your son for us. And Jesus, you died on the cross. We were talking about awful this morning, or awesome, I guess a more modern term. And we can't fathom it. What a supreme sacrifice. So in your holy name we pray. Amen. It almost feels like a high Sabbath. And, and the reason I say that is my daughter's back from school. Um, Florine's back in church. Um, it's just nice to see guests and people. It's like, it has, it has a good vibe, Wally. It has a good vibe this morning. And the Lord is blessing us in our, in our service. And so, you know, one of the things we did is that, as you see, we're getting bigger. People are coming. So what we did is we actually set up a little section over there, okay? And we thought maybe if, if sometimes I noticed some parents would take their children out, and I feel bad for them because they'll be missing out in the sermon. So we create a little section for you. We turn the TV on. So if you have to step out for a second, you can still watch the sermon and still hear it. Because we want you missing out. So we just want to have ability for you guys. So if you have young children, don't be afraid to use that space um, so you can still worship together and not feel that you're missing out on something. So God has been really good to us. Amen. Turn with me. You're going to need your Bibles today. There'll be a lot of... Is it okay if you use this a little bit today? Um, we'll be a little flipping flopping today. And turn with me to John chapter 17, 14 to 16. John 17. Um, I'll be using the, the King James, so it'll be a little thou on these, but it's not bad. In John 17, verses 14 to 16, it, Jesus, this is the word of Jesus. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray that thou shouldest, shouldest take them out of the world, but thou should keep us from the evil. For they are not of the world, for even I am not of this world. The title of the sermon is Earthly Kingdom, the Judgment of this world. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, please bless our time together. Enrich us with your blessing and give us insight into your truth. I pray in your name. Amen. I want to start off scripture this morning with Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10, verse 8 through 10. So go to your Bibles again. Genesis chapter 10, 8 through 10. We read the story a genealogy of the first king. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be the mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter <coughs> before the Lord. In the beginning of the kingdom of Babel and Uruk, and Akhed and Karnith in the land of Shinar. I want to tell you a legend. Well, legend means a story. I can't totally authenticate it, but it's a legend that I read. And this legend begins after Noah's flood. After Noah's flood, he had, he had three sons, right? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, the story goes, Ham defiled the father, and Ham was cursed. So out of his line came the rebellion. Out of his line came Cush and came Nimrod. Now, what is interesting is that Nimrod became the great warrior on earth. And I believe, and many historians believe, he, he became the first great king of earth after Noah's flood. 
At that time, all the people had still lived together. Does that make sense? They have yet to separate through the rest of the earth. They all lived near the plain of Shinar. And Nebuchadnezzar became a great king and a great warrior. And he put all the people back together again. Now, here's the problem with people in general. When evil people get together, they plan evil things. And because of that, God had to do some terrible things to, I would say, to save humanity. People often say, well, you know, God looks a little vindictive when he wiped out the first people of the world. When the floods came, remember that story? And the people were wiped out. And wow, God is being so, such a mean God. But I, I have a different perspective on that. The Bible tells us that the people before the flood thought evil when? Always. Continuously. They were continuously doing evil things to each other, to the planet, to the animals. And, and this is one of the saddest commentaries the Bible has. You guys remember the commentary? God what? He was remorseful. He was sad that he had created this world because there was so much pain in this world. So God used a flood to wipe out the first kingdom, would I believe, to save humanity. Does that make sense to you? God had to bring the flood because if God didn't bring the flood, the world would have self-terminated. They would have killed itself. So God wiped out most of the world, saved eight, Noah and his family. But here we go again. As soon as God saved the eight, the people began to rise up and they began to, again, rebel against God. Nimrod, Nimrod set himself to be king. But here's an interesting fact. Nimrod was alive, but he wasn't the, what would we call it, the most revered person <clears throat> after the flood. You know who the most revered person was after the flood? Noah. Noah was revered because he was a father, still, of all nations. He also had a son who had three sons, but the most prominent son was Shem. Shem was a God believer. So and how this legend goes, there was a rebellion against Shem and a rebellion against Noah. If you imagine at this time, the evil ones outnumbered the godly ones. Does that make sense? And then Noah and Shem was regulated, relegated out to the outcasts. They were not part of the main anymore. And the story goes, Nimrod actually wanted to destroy Noah and destroy Shem because they posed a threat to Nimrod's power. What is interesting is that there was a young man at that time living in the time of Noah, of Shem, and Nimrod. And this young man's name was Abraham. Abraham was very young when Noah was alive. Noah and Abraham actually met each other. What is, what is really interesting to me is that we have a story of Abraham, the story of Abraham that was passed to, to Noah, sorry, passed to Moses. But you know what's interesting is that Abraham, Abraham got first account. You hear me? First account. What happened before the flood? How did he get that first account? He heard it through Noah, and he heard it through Shem. So we have, through historical knowledge, that the story of Adam and Eve and all the things that happened before the flood actually happened. It's not just some kind of fabrication. Abraham actually sat there and was a student of Noah, a student of Shem, and then Abraham became the line which God used to save the people of earth. Nimrod knew this, and he wanted to destroy that line. But he wanted the power for himself. And we know how this story turned out. Nimrod created huge tower. The tower of what? Babel. And what does Babel mean? It means confusion. 
It means confusion. And that's one thing God did. God decided, here we go again, right? God is looking down. I wiped you guys out once, and here we go again. You're doing the same thing. Now, God made a promise, didn't he? Didn't God make a promise? And he said, I can't bring the rain again, but I promise I wouldn't flood the earth again. So God had another plan, plan B, as you will, and B for Babel, I guess, it makes sense. And then he confused the languages, which ultimately spread humanity throughout the world. The most, I would say, the person who was upset the most by this was Nimrod. He had a plan. He had a desire. And you know who took charge? God did. God took charge. I want you to turn with me. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. If you have your, if you have your uh, little uh, smartphones, you can just go to 2 Corinthians. If you have your traditional book Bibles, uh, it's in the New Testament. You'll find it past Romans. You'll find 1 Corinthians, and you'll find 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, look what Paul says. In whom the God of what? This world, okay, have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest their light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Let me ask you a question. Who did, just, who did Paul just call the God of this world? Lucifer. Does that, does that make sense? The God calls the ruler of this world Satan. Paul says he is the ruler of this world. He owns this world. And we know if we study, I guess, study the history, we know that when Adam sinned, he gave the dominion of this world. Now, ultimately... God owns everything. Does that make sense? God owns everything. But what God did, he gave authority to Adam and Eve to be rulers of the... Does that make sense? Everything is owned by God. Let's that, that, be clear. God owns the mountains and the sheep. and He owns everything. He's God, okay? But he gave authority to Adam and Eve to be rulers of... Of this world, therefore giving them a job. Remember the job that Adam had? Naming the animals. So he had authority over this world. But when he sinned, he gave up that authority to who? To Lucifer. And Satan became the authority of this world. Let's go keep on going. Let's go another verse. Like I said, you're gonna be flipping on a little bit today. And let's go to Daniel chapter four. Daniel chapter 4, verse 7. This is where we'll take the sermon idea today. Daniel 4, verse 7. Daniel is in the Old Testament, and you look for Isaiah, you keep on going, you see Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and you'll find Daniel. Okay? In Daniel chapter 4, verse 7, let's read these words. Then came the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And I told the dream before them, and they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. In in the Korean world, um, we are very, our culture is very shamanistic. I'm not sure if that means anything to you. Shamanistic. Um, means that as Koreans, many Koreans worship, not worship necessarily, they talk to the dead. Okay, that's what it means to be shamanistic. So actually in Korea, every year we'll go to our grandparents, well, if I did live in Korea, actually when I did go back last year, we did go visit the burial site. And the Koreans do it a little differently. They don't, they don't necessarily bury down below, they kind of build above. They have a big old mound. So my grandma, my grandpa, I guess my aunt, or a couple aunts, are all buried in this mound. 
So, so what we do is we come to the mound, and traditionally we bring food and we bring alcohol. Yeah, they like alcohol, okay? And so what you do is you go to the mound and you, and you bow reverently to the dead, but you also put food, which supposedly we're feeding them, and you get the alcohol and you pour the alcohol on the grave. That's how you give them drinks, okay? Um, it's a very shamanistic ideology. We call it respecting our fathers or our mothers. Now, we know as Christians that they're, they can't eat the food and they can't drink the alcohol. They're sleeping quite well. But did you know that most people of this world believe in spirits? Most people believe in spirits. Actually, most religions teach about spirits. When the Bible, sorry, when the Bible tells us a story about the devil and what was his lie to Eve? You shall not surely die. <clears throat> that was a lie that Adam and Eve was told by Lucifer. You shall not surely die. That belief system has kept us even to this day. To the point, if you go down the street, I'll show you a psychic. Okay, there are psychics. I'll show you there are people who have relationships with the dead. Okay, we believe in ghosts. We believe in talking to things of the air. And the Bible explicitly says you shouldn't talk to those people. Why? Because those ghosts or those dead are not dead people. We know by the Bible they are demons. Is that making sense? So when we people, thinking we're talking to our long lost uncle or, or grandpa from eons ago, and they, trust me, people have seen ghosts come out of the ground. The Bible even talks about it. Remember, remember Saul? Who did he see? He saw Samuel come out of the ground. So there are people who've seen evidence of these things. But the Bible tells us Dead people are not alive. Now, for some of you, this might be like, Pastor, what are you talking about? I never heard that before. That is true. We have been lied to for a very long time. And one of the most deceitful lies that we've been told to is that dead people can talk. The Bible has told us not to go there because when we do talk to dead people, we're not talking to the dead. Who are we talking to? We're talking to demons. Because we do believe in fallen angels. Do you remember that? Remember the battle in heaven? How many angels fell down? A third of the angels. We read that in Revelation, didn't we? That in Revelation 12, a third of the angels came into this ground. And those Fallen angels have become the demons of today. So if Nebuchadnezzar is talking to these magicians, is talking to these shamans, is talking to these uh, astrologers, who is Nebuchadnezzar talking to? Demons. And, and if you go throughout even Korean history, there's always been astrologers. There's always been shamans who have given advice to the kings. I want to tell you something. If you look in history, almost, not almost, every single kingdom, Africa, Asia, Europe, you name it, there was spiritual guides. Does that make sense to you? There, there's always been spiritual guides. So if we put two and two together... Who is leading the worldly leaders? The devil. Does that make sense? So what God is trying to tell us as Christians, let us not take our lead from the magicians. And we read this chapter in Daniel. It's not about the world. It's how God leads his people. Now, is God alive? Absolutely. Is God speaking? 
Absolutely. And can we tap to God and his angels anytime we want? Yes, we can. So let's go to Daniel. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 4. And let's read. Let's read. 10. Let's go to verse 10. Let's go to verse 10. So, thus were the visions of my head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great, and the tree grew and was strong. And the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof in the end of the earth. The leaves thereof was fair, and the fruit thereof was much, and it was meat for all. And the beasts of the field had a shadow under it, and the fowls of heaven dwelt the thoughts thereof, and all the flesh was fed of it. So in this vision, Nebuchadnezzar saw himself as a tree. And a tree that was huge and strong. But in this vision, later on in this vision, Daniel interprets the vision and tells him, you, Nebuchadnezzar, will be humbled. What's fascinating about Daniel chapter 4 is this. I mean, I could be wrong, or maybe you could tell me. I don't know of any chapter in the book of the Bible written by a non-Israelite or a, or a non-follower of God. I don't. I, I, just, I was rattling my mind. Was Is there any other chapter in the Bible written by a non Christian per se or non-Israelite and I couldn't find one. This is the only chapter, Daniel chapter 4. It was written by, if you read the beginning of the chapter, it says I, who? Nebuchadnezzar. It's fascinating. To me, this story is amazing because we have a pagan king writing in a holy book. That's why I believe that Nebuchadnezzar had a change of heart. That he had become a follower of God. Of, of God. When he understood God's goodness and righteousness. So this is a fascinating book. This is the only chapter I could think of not written by a pen of an Israelite. So in this story, we see that God is ultimately in control. Not kings, not leaders, but God. Go with me, Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11 Verse 6 through 9. Verse 6 through 9. Genesis 11, 6 through 9. Eleven six through 9. And the Lord said, Behold, the people are as one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. Now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have in imagine to do go to let us go down and there confound their languages that they may not understand one another so the lord scattered them abroad from thence from the face of all the earth and they left off to build the city therefore the name of the called is babel because the lord did not con- lord did confound their language and of all the earth and from thence did the lord scatter them abroad the broad on the face of the earth How did God stop humanity from going rebellious again? What did God do? He, he changed languages. God knew when the world worked together. This is a scary thing. You would think if the world work, worked together, it would be a positive thing, right? I mean, is that good? We should all work together and be as one. It sounds really good, okay? But here's the problem. People are sinful, And when sinful people work together, they do terrible things. And God knew this, and God saw this, and in God's mind, he said, I got to stop this. So he changed languages, and they split all over the face of the earth. Now, let's fast forward to 2021. What language does the world speak now? The French don't like it, okay? They don't want to admit, okay? I mean, why can't we all speak French, right? Right? Um, Chinese, there's a billion Chinese, okay? All right? But there is a common language now, isn't there? 
Because when you go to the internet, unfortunately, like it or not, you got to speak English. Um, it's fascinating now. If you go to China, and you'll meet these people who speak really good English because they just watch YouTube all day. Okay? And they speak really good English now. And they grow up in it now. And, they're, and, I, and I, I went to Korea, and I listened to these kids. Their accents are really good. It's like, man, that's some really good English because they get to hear it and they get to see it. And that's become a common language. And have you ever heard something called the, the League of Nations? It was a global attempt to unify the world. It didn't work so well, kind of floundered. But when it floundered, they created something else called the United Nations. And that's still going. And, but you ever heard of this terminology, new world order? You ever heard that phrase, new world order? A world unified to bring peace and harmony. Oh, I love their words, right? It, it sounds so good. Okay, to bring a, a better future for the world. They, they, oh, they, they, put, they make it sound so nice. Okay, But what does the Bible teach us about world unity? It doesn't happen. Remember in Daniel chapter 2? Remember we talked about Daniel chapter 2? Remember that big statue we talked about? The feet. Remember the feet? Just before the end of time, the feet. What was the flea, feet made out of? Iron and clay, signifying to us that the world will never be unified again. That is spoken of God. God gave that vision. So I believe that. But we have a contradiction of ideas now, don't we? Because the Bible tells us the world will never be unified. Never. But the world is trying to do what? To unify. You go to Europe, the European what? Union. So the world is trying to unify. The Bible says this. When people cry what? Peace and safety. Then the destruction will come. Do you hear the warnings of Christ? Do you hear it? Do you see it today in 2021? There is a push for world unity there's a push to coalesce together for, they say, for the good, for peace, and for love, okay? It always, it always makes me a little sad, I guess, when people say, make love, not war, and they make, they, you know, they, they, we should all love each other, and then they're blowing up our cities. It just, it's, 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 it's just very odd to me. I mean... We said we should stand up for people and rights and, and love, and they're yelling profanities at each other. I'm like, okay, the world doesn't understand what peace and love. Not the biblical version, right? Because Jesus says his peace, what? Passes what? All understanding. The peace that God wants to give is greater than what the world has to give. In verse 17, in verse chapter 4, just maybe you want to keep her little thing there, my little. It says, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable thee, and break off the sins of thy righteousness and thy iniquity by. Oh, sorry, that's not 17, that's 27. That's what I get from not reading my glasses. And it says, the matter is by decree of the watchers and of the demand by the word of the holy, holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth the kingdom of men and giveth to whomever he will and set up over to all he has basis of men. What does God say? What does God say? Who is the ruler of this world? God is. He sets up kingdoms, and he tears kingdoms down. God is the one in, ultimately in control. I, as a pastor, I sense in 2021, since 2020 just finished, I sense great confusion, and I sense great fear. I'm not, I'm not sure if you sense it. There seems to be a lot of confusion and fear in our world today. And, and, we, 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 and we're arguing about a lot of things, 
you know? We're arguing about presidents, you know, Reagan or Clinton or Obama or Biden or Trump. We, we're, we're warring with each other. There seems to be a, a social, our social fabric seems to be breaking down a bit. And I sense more fear than usual. And my friends, I believe that what Satan ultimately wants to do is create fear in us. That we're afraid to walk, we're afraid to talk, we're afraid to do anything, and we're, we're frozen with fear. And God is saying, do not be afraid. In Revelation 14, 8. Yeah, okay, I'm running out of time, but bear with me. Revelation 14, 8. The last book in the Bible. The second angel says this in Revelation 14, 8. It says, And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because he has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon. You, like, you, hear, you see the connection there? Babylon is from, the, from where, Nim, sorry, where Nebuchadnezzar was. Where did Babylon get its name from? From Babel, from where Nimrod came from. There has been a system, a system of rebellion from the time of Nimrod to Nebuchadnezzar through Rome through now, a system of rebellion. And what the Bible is saying, that system is fallen. That system is broken. And what God is going to do, he's going to judge this world. This world is in rebellion. God is just. God is good. And he will show the fruits thereof. People are saying to me, Pastor, why is all this stuff happening? Why is all this stuff happening? You know, they asked God the same question. When Lucifer fell... When Adam fell, they said, God, why is this all happening? We've never seen death before. There's never been rebellion, God. Why, why are you letting Lucifer live? I, people question that. They said, God, why are you letting Lucifer happen? And God in his wisdom says, I have to show what Lucifer is about. Does that make sense to you? If Lucifer was taken out, God would have been called a dictator. You hear me? God would, have, God would have been someone that they feared, not in a healthy way, but feared as in the scared fear. That if we spoke our minds, God's going to wipe us out too. So God, in his wisdom and mercy, had to let sin play out. In 2021, people might ask the question, Pastor, why is all this stuff happening? Why are we sitting here in masks? Why are this happening? Why is plagues all, why, why is all this evil happening? And, and he's like, doesn't, does, doesn't God love us? Why is this happening? And what I'm trying to tell you, God has to let this world play out. He has to show the world what its decisions will come to. He has to show the universe, these are the decisions the world has made. These are the decisions that my people have made. And now look at the difference. My friends, Bible prophecy in Daniel chapter 4 is telling us that the earthly kingdoms will always fail. The dictates of this world will always fail. The dictates of God will never fail. And that's where I want us to be standing on. The last verse I want to do is go with me Genesis sorry jo Joshua 1 9 Joshua is right after the Pentateuch if you know what that is that's after Deuteronomy you'll see Joshua and Joshua chapter 1 after the five books of Moses you'll read Joshua and you'll try to find chapter 1 verse 9 it says have I not commanded thee be strong and be of good courage be not afraid neither by or does dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whichever thou goest. God has a message for us today. Be strong. Be courageous. Don't let this world get to you. Don't let all the media and all the news frighten you. 
Don't let the world scare you and think, oh, this world's all crazy. We're gonna... No, God is in control. He'll take care of you. And we don't have to live in fear. We can live in confidence. My brothers and sisters, be confident. We have a God that loves you. We have a God that cares for you. And you don't have to be afraid of the world. Yes, there's a lot of crazy stuff coming from the world. I know. But that's not the point. God is the point. He will take care of you. The world has been judged and judged as being short. God has also been judged as being correct and righteous and good. We are a people of God. Let us trust him. Let us be strong. Let us be courageous. And don't let this world get you down. Live the life that God wants you to live. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the story of Nebuchadnezzar. A man who was at top, brought down below. But when he was brought down, he, he cried the mercies of God and he became a saved soul. And Father, Father heaven, heaven, help us, us people of being people that rely on you, not ourselves. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to listen to your message this day and bless us, we pray. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Next week, we look at chapter five. Do not, do not be, what is the word? Confident in riches, but it's not all about money and riches either. But that's next week, chapter five. God bless you. We have a wonderful week, and we'll see you back here next week. God bless.